Hello, this is Dr. Adam J. Bach. In this short audio presentation, we're going to talk about some key aspects of entrepreneurship in the context of technology entrepreneurship. We need to get a couple things out of the way first. First of all, I have no interest in turning you into an entrepreneur. That's not what this course is about. If you're an entrepreneur now, or you at the end of the course you decide you really want to be an entrepreneur, I'm very happy for you. But if you aren't comfortable with the idea of entrepreneurship, or at the end of the course you discover this really isn't what you're interested in, I'm equally happy for you. The last thing I want is to send you out into the world to be an entrepreneur if it's going to make you miserable, especially if you've already raised millions of dollars at that point in time. Second of all, the textbook is totally wrong when it says only about a third of new ventures survive the first three years. That, statistically, that's just fundamentally incorrect. Statistics provided by the U.S. Department of Commerce um, and by other governments around the world consistently show that roughly half of all new ventures survive for about five years, if not a little more. Um, the textbook is probably referencing the idea that about a third of, tech, of companies that raise venture capital only survive for three or four years. That might be more accurate. Um, and that's because venture firms that raise venture capital face some very specific challenges, including the fact that venture capitalists are there to do one of two things, either to make a ton of money off a of venture if it's going well, or to shut it down as fast as possible if things aren't going well in order to prevent putting more resources into it. Um, but this myth that, you know, two-thirds, three-quarters, 80% of new ventures are dead within three years, that's a myth. That's all it is. And there's no statistics that show that that's the case across sectors, markets, or geographies. Um, so please be aware of that. On the other hand, the book is totally right when it says that entrepreneurship is not easy. As change agents, entrepreneurs must be willing to accept failure as a potential outcome of their venture. And I couldn't agree more. If you're not comfortable with failure, the possibility of both near-term and long-term failure, then entrepreneurship is not for you. Um, and yes, by the way, this is as exciting as my slides get. Um, I do live in kind of an exciting world with startup companies, technology, financing, but it doesn't extend to my slides. Sorry. Uh, your book provides kind of a nice way of thinking about entrepreneurship that's really worth emphasizing. This idea of the sweet spot between an attractive opportunity, the capabilities of the team, and the interests, passions, and commitment of the team. Um, the issue is that most entrepreneurs tend to focus on only three factors, sort of how sexy the opportunity is, you know, machine language, biotech, whatever it happens to be. The potential financial return that they're hoping to get out of it, and their own specific technological interests. And those are all, you know, important or relevant, but there are usually some missing links. The first one tends to be whether or not there's real customer needs associated with the innovation. And that's something we're going to talk about pretty much all semester. Second, whether the team really has the capabilities and commitment to execute. Yes, there are examples of entrepreneurs who launch ventures without the skills they need and kind of learn them over time. And some of those have obviously been hugely successful, people like Mark Zuckerberg. But those are the exceptions, right? Those are the outliers. Um, and going down that path on the theory that you'll simply learn what you need as you go along and you're not going to build a team around you is more often a recipe for failure than success. And then finally, whether there's a favorable context for execution. This is the reality that a certain amount of what you're going to try to be dealing with is out of your control. Uh, is there a good industry set? Is there a good industry context? How are market conditions? How's the broader economic environment? So please try to keep these in mind as you're thinking about opportunities and whether they're attractive or not. The textbook also provides kind of a very simplistic but you know, relatively useful way of just kind of being reminded about the inputs and outputs of entrepreneurial activity, right? So there's a lot of different types of capital that are required for successful technology venturing. It includes, broadly speaking, natural capital, financial capital specifically associated with the cash infusions that a, a tech and growing company are likely to need, and then the intellectual capital that uh, is required as part of the underlying innovation. Um, a good way to think about this is that the entrepreneur is kind of the critical link for taking action to convert those forms of capital into some type of outputs, right? At the same time, we need to keep in mind a few you know, details. One is that beneficial outputs from this type of activity are not going to be fairly distributed, right? The universe is not a fair place. There's no universal law that says everybody gets what they deserve. Um, 
And it's one of the challenges that many technology entrepreneurs face as they're in the process of launching a venture, that they have to come to terms with this fact, that it's, there's no way to perfectly measure fairness and to divide up potential returns or even to divide up the risks associated with a venture. And the second one is that there are going to be some undesired waste outputs from this process. Some of those are going to be failed ventures. They may be fired co-founders, even in a successful venture. And sometimes they involve abandoned technologies that don't survive the process of commercialization, even when that was the original innovation that was being considered for the opportunity. Here's the hard truth about entrepreneurship. And this is one of my favorite little quotes about it um, from Mike Olson. If you are the CEO of a technology startup and you're sleeping through the night, you're doing it wrong. Now, let's you know, be clear. There are some CEOs who, for various reasons, are quite happy uh, in the startup process. And they do sleep at least a few hours a night. But my own experience and the research that's been, out, that's been done out there strongly suggests that the majority of people who start, launch, and run early stage and growth ventures do experience a significant amount of stress. So here are some good questions that you might want to think about uh, if you're considering launching a technology venture. Are you comfortable stretching rules and, convention, and questioning conventional wisdom? Um, this is very much a situation in which you're going to be asked to potentially make decisions that are in the gray areas, whether those are ethical or legal or simply re uh, associated with norms of an industry or market. Are you prepared to take on powerful competitors? That's almost always going to be the case when you're bringing in novel innovations. What, what level of perseverance do you have? Are you comfortable with the possibility that this will have to start small and grow relatively slowly? Again, examples like the explosive growth of companies like Instagram are the exception, not the rule. Are you willing and able to shift strategies quickly? That includes being willing to recognize what you, that what you thought was wrong or what you were doing was wrong. And fundamentally, are you a good deal closer and decision maker? If you find decision making to be stressful, if you find hard selling to be challenging, if you're not really comfortable being in a tough negotiation, then this may not exactly be your cup of tea. On the other hand, you don't have to do all these things alone, right? Part of entrepreneurship is very often bringing in a competent team to fill in the areas that you're not as good at. What is an entrepreneur? Well, even that, uh, from a definitional perspective, is, is somewhat uh, uh, uncertain or still under consideration. Um, a dictionary might suggest that it's someone who creates and then assumes the risks of a business or enterprise. Um, but there are some other definitions that are worth mentioning. The most famous definition, of course, is probably uh, from Schumpeter, which is uh, that an entrepreneur is someone who participates in this process of creative destruction, someone who invests time to create new combinations based on a dream and the will to found a private kingdom. So a really nice mix of pure economic theory and a little bit of sort of uh, more humanistic perspective. One of my favorite definitions, quite frankly, is from Stevenson, who suggested that entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. It's kind of a nice way of thinking about it because when we think about what managers do, they're often given a set of resources and a goal, and their job is to create a path from one to the other. Stevenson's pointing out that entrepreneurship is when you take one or both of those constraints away, right? Uh, the assumption is you're going to go after a goal that people aren't going after now, and you're going to do it without worrying about whether you have the resources currently or not. A more broad and simplistic definition is one that uh, I personally believe in, which is that an entrepreneur is anyone who sees an opportunity and takes action to create change. Now, clearly, this gets us out of the, the focus on just business alone. Uh, and so you may want to be cautious about how far you take this definition in other contexts. We could very easily argue that someone like Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi was an entrepreneur. And in some ways, I think they were. They were sort of social entrepreneurs in the context of looking, seeing situations that require change and an opportunistic time to make that change happen. But you'll certainly find people who would push back against the argument that they were, quote unquote, entrepreneurs. But it's useful to recognize the role of entrepreneurs in broader economic systems because entrepreneurs do play significant roles. And there's no shortage of statistics about how tech venturing and venturing in general is responsible for a significant amount of job creation and wealth creation and value creation and innovation and all those kinds of things. So I'm not going to go into those. What I do want to do is encourage you to kind of have a framework in mind for how you think about what entrepreneurial the entrepreneurial role is. And this one's a, this is a little bit 
um, hyperbolic, but I think it's useful sort of from a generic perspective, right? So again, managers are responsible for optimizing business operations and profit within a given sort of wave or a given technological and operational framework, right? And so the textbook gives you this sort of nice picture of different waves of sort of technological generations, right? Um, and so one way of thinking about this is that, you know, whereas managers kind of get you from the first part of the curve to the sec to the sort of the end of the curve, um, entrepreneurs are responsible for leading organizations from one wave to the next. And not just, you know, at this huge sort of decade driven level, but within waves as well, right? Because any one of these has, you know, internal waves, right? So the transition from one type of networking infrastructure to another, um, is sort of a little mini wave. And so that was something where entrepreneurs are the ones who tend to lead the way by either forming new organizations or helping uh, existing organizations transition from one framework to another. So here are some quick final thoughts on entrepreneurship. It's really important to keep in mind that the factors associated with choosing to be an entrepreneur are not necessarily the same ones that are associated with being successful as an entrepreneur. So the research suggests that people are more likely to become an entrepreneur if they have high self-esteem, high need for achievement and independence, they're good on learning aptitude tests, GPA not so much, comfortable with a certain amount of calculated risk taking, and then some levels of innovativeness and creativity and generally optimistic. And all of those things can drive people to make the decision to become an entrepreneur. Interestingly, the factors that appear to be more linked to being successful as an entrepreneur are high degrees of discipline and executive function, willingness to fail and learn, team building, leadership and delegation, and in particular, recognizing trade-offs, especially the trade-off between control and speed and success, right? Because many of these situations that entrepreneurs face require deciding, do I want to be in control of this or do I want to bring more people in in order to be able to go faster? This is a really critical issue to recognize that the people who often found companies are not always the best people to grow those companies. So you might want to ponder that, especially if you're thinking about, number one, whether you have an idea that you want to launch a company for, and whether you fit that sort of being an entrepreneur perspective and maybe not so much the being successful perspective. Or if you know you have some of those being successful skills, but simply don't have an idea to work on at the moment. This kind of gets back to this critical question of whether entrepreneurs should be solo entrepreneurs or team entrepreneurs. Just so you know, the research pretty consistently shows that team entrepreneurs have higher success rates than solo entrepreneurs. So I hope this gives you some perspective on entrepreneurship in the context of technology entrepreneurship and some thoughts possibly for your own level of interest in entrepreneurship.